bring something on on this? Yeah. Oh, there we go. All right. I think. Been a day. <laughs> well, good evening and welcome to worship. Praise God for this wonderful weather, huh? Just kind of boosts our spirit and all that good stuff. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Please join me in the opening prayer as printed in your bulletin. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace, and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our opening hymn is 95, Glory Be to Jesus. many people. After leaving the synagogue that day, Jesus went to Simon's home, where he found Simon's mother-in-law very sick with a high fever. Please heal her, everyone begged. Standing at her bedside, he rebuked the fever, and it left her. And she got up at once and prepared a meal for them. Isn't that always funny? As the sun went down that evening, people throughout the village brought sick family members to Jesus. No matter what their diseases were, the touch of his hand healed everyone. Many were possessed by demons, and the demons came out at his command, shouting, You are the Son of God. But because they knew he was the Messiah, he rebuked them and refused to let them speak. Early the next morning, Jesus went out to an isolated place. The crowd searched everywhere for him, and when they finally found him, they begged him not to leave them. But he replied, I must preach the good news of the kingdom of God in other towns too, because that is why I have been sent. And so he continued to travel around preaching in the synagogues throughout Judea. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. I never thought she should have married him in the first place. I told her he would never be home. He was impulsive, had a temper, and was always spouting off about something or another. And besides, I didn't 
know as much about his family as I wanted to. Oh, we had met his father, Jonah, and he seemed like a likable man. But his son, Peter, well, that was a different story. I don't know how much you know about the marriage of, marriages of our time. Usually it was the parents who arranged the marriages. More often than not, the parents knew each other better than the kids who were getting married. But you might know for our, that for our kids, it was the other way around. She fell for him the first time she laid eyes on him. Don't ask me what she saw, but she wouldn't be talked out of it. And as I said, they were a nice enough family. And I suppose it could have been a lot worse. He was a fisherman. He always hung out with the sons of Zebedee. Now those two were a couple of handfuls. Don't get me wrong, but being a fisherman was an honorable profession. It's just that they, they were always gone. More often than not, they'd be fishing all night. And by the time they came in after the night's fishing, got the fish cleaned, and to the market, got the nets cleaned up and ready for the next night, they'd be so tired, they'd usually just sleep until it was time to go out again. They were really a pretty rough bunch, big talkers, big ideas about what they were going to do and how they were going to revolutionize the fishing industry, have the biggest fishing ex enterprise of the Sea of Gallery and that kind of thing. Not that I minded all that male bravado. In fact, I guess I remember when my husband was in his younger days, he acted a lot like Peter. Unfortunately, he wasn't around to talk to about these things. He died a few years earlier during some other sort of plague. We didn't have the medical knowledge you have, nor the medicines that you do. Whenever an illness ravaged a community, we could do little about it. Maybe that's why things bothered me so much. I just didn't have anyone to talk to about them. I don't know. Maybe it was only my loneliness that made me feel for my daughter. I just wanted Peter to spend a little more time with her. But then I guess I should have just kept out of it. Every time I tried to bring up the subject, my daughter would say, Oh, Mom, that's just Peter. I know he loves me. Well, it was obvious how she felt about him. And I have to admit, even if things weren't perfect or the way I would have liked them, he was always kind to her and he treated her in a special way, at least whenever I was around. Remember when I told you how impulsive I thought Peter was? Well, something happened that not only confirmed it, but just about sent me right to the brink. Now, I told you I wasn't crazy about his occupation fishing, but at least it was an occupation, and at least he had a fairly regular income. I knew my daughter wasn't going to starve. Can you imagine what I thought when my daughter told me that her husband wasn't going to fish anymore? That he was going to be a disciple of an itinerant preacher by the name of Jesus? Where did this notion come from? Who is this Jesus? Why in the world is Peter going to follow him? And where was he going to follow him? Who's going to put bread on the table for my daughter? And what about their children? Hadn't they thought about having a family? How is he going to raise a family if he doesn't have a job? And how are they ever going to start a family if he's going to be off somewhere doing who knows what? And with who knows who? Well, for some reason, my daughter didn't seem to have any concerns that I did. She just met this Jesus, and although she couldn't seem to describe him exactly, why she felt the way she did, she just knew that things would turn out all right. You should meet him. Save your judgment until you, at least you meet him, she would say. Well, what can you say to that? What do you say when your own child throws back at you the same words you used to teach her about right and wrong and judging others? What do you expect? Yes, dear, I guess you're right. I will try not to judge him until I've at least, at least met him. It would be several months before I had that chance, but during those months, I began hearing all kinds of reports about what my Peter and this Jesus were doing throughout the area. Some of the my neighbors told me that they had just gone to hear this Jesus speak. They remarked that he had a way with people, that people were drawn to him. And still, I had my doubts. Intinerant preachers were always going here and there. Some advocated overthrowing the Roman government. Others just fancied themselves great speakers, but most of them never amounted to anything. Perhaps they were popular for a while, but then a year later, no one even remembered who they were or what they said. 
What was Peter getting himself into? As the days went on, I heard more and more reports about this Jesus had actually helped people. And not just the kind of things that people can fake, but actual people who others had known to be crippled or blind since birth. You can't fake that. I began to think that my daughter was right about this Jesus, and then the day came when I first met him. By this time, I had moved in with my daughter. It was a mutual decision, partly because of my health, but partly because I'd been right about Peter not being home much. It was a chance for us to keep each other company. Not long after I was settled in their home, Peter and some of his friends, along with Jesus, came to the house to get away for a couple days. They had talked about how the crowds were constantly pressing on them and how Everyone wanted to get close to Jesus, both to hear him and to receive healing from every disease. You could see them, they were exhausted, so my daughter and I fixed a meal for them. I wanted to ask a lot of questions, but I didn't know whether or not it was proper for me to do so. And as it turned out, I didn't have to. While I was busy cooking, it was Jesus who took the initiative to talk to me. It was strange. It was as though he knew all my questions, the concerns, and the fears for my daughter. He talked about Peter, about his impulsiveness and bravado, and we laughed about it. But then he told me how he had such tremendous leadership potential underneath that rough exterior of his. Maybe that's what my daughter saw that I couldn't. That night after supper, he taught us all about the scriptures in a way that I had never heard. He was able to explain things in a way that we could all understand. And the next morning, I got up early to fix breakfast. Jesus came in while I was cooking. Seems he had gone out before dawn to spend time in prayer. He looked refreshed and full of energy. He asked about my husband and even offered a prayer for peace and strength for me. He seemed to know that the pain of my loss had far from disappeared. After those days, I spent many others following Jesus and watching from a distance. And I began to see what Peter and the others saw. I came to believe that Jesus was a teacher sent from God. No one could do what he did and what he said unless he came from God. Then came the day that I would experience the divine power myself. I had come down with a fever and I felt like I was burning up. I was in my bed at my daughter's, at my daughter's and she would alternate covering me up when I was chilled and bringing water when I was hot. And all I could think of was that my husband had such a fever before he died. I kept falling into a deep sleep, and each time I woke up, I could see the worry on my daughter's face. I didn't know it, but she had sent word for Peter to come home. I'm sure she wondered, just as I did, what would happen. I would find out later that Peter did come home, but he had not come alone. He brought Jesus with him, and all I remember is this. I opened my eyes, and I saw Jesus standing over me, and he smiled, and he reached down to take my hand. And as soon as his hand touched mine, something happened that I just can't explain. A kind of tingling literally surged through my entire body, and I soon realized that my fever was gone. I sat up, I kind of shook my head in disbelief, and found that I was completely well, full of strength. I stood up, and not knowing what to do, I just reached out and I put my arms around Jesus and kissed him. I think I kind of took him by surprise. He got the stunned look on his face, and we both laughed. I didn't know how to thank him, so I did what I knew how to do best. I went to the kitchen and started cooking. I don't know how Jesus and the others felt, but that meal, that night, it was the, tasted better than any other meal I'd ever cooked. Well, at least to me it did. After that night, no one knew better than me that my son-in-law, Peter, had made the right decision. Of course, none of us could know what was coming. No one could have guessed that Jesus would one day be arrested and killed. We were all devastated. People barely spoke to each other. How could such a thing happen? Not only that, but Peter, John, and some of the women that had gone to the tomb on Sunday and Jesus' body was gone, no one knew what to think. Peter was beside himself and he would break into an uncontrolled weeping. And he kept talking about how he, more than anyone, had let Jesus down. And about how he had denied him, denied even knowing him. We didn't know what he meant, only that it was that he was inconsolable. And then everything changed. Peter came running through the door. We've seen him and he's alive. 
Several days later, we too would see Jesus. <clears throat> it was true. It was all true. Jesus was alive. And suddenly hope, and hope was alive again, and our lives would never be the same. Yours never need be the same again either. Jesus is alive. He is here tonight. Trust him. Follow him. Peter was right. Jesus is the one we've been waiting for. Thank you, Lisa. Um, our hymn of the day is hymn number 99. <coughs> out there, and I don't want to put anyone on the spot, but if they would like to come up for a message, um, one thing I've said, we will always have a children's message, but if kids are nervous to come up, that's okay too. So would you like to come up and join me for a message? Perfect. I'm glad you guys came up. So, I don't know if you were listening to this story today, but have you ever been sick? Remember being sick? Like, how are you sick? Did you have a cold, or did you have the flu, or, or you didn't feel very good and had to stay in bed? So when you're sick, do you, do you get up and run around and play? No, you stay in bed, right, when you rest? That would be kind of strange, wouldn't it? If you were sick, what do you think your mom would do if you were sick and running around playing? Wouldn't she like that? No, she'd say, go back to bed. You have to, you have to rest. Well, in our story today, Jesus healed Peter's mother-in-law. And do you know what? She had been really sick. And do you know what she did after she got well? She got up and started cooking for everyone. Doesn't that seem funny? She was sick, and she got healed, and she got right up, and she started cooking. That's pretty, that's pretty funny, isn't it? But Jesus made her well that fast, because Jesus has such great healing power. He can make somebody well right away. So when you're sick, and you're not feeling well, and you think, oh, am I ever going to get better? You know, one thing you can do, you can pray to Jesus. And you say, dear Jesus, help me to get well, because I'm just not feeling well. And a lot of times, that will make you feel a lot better. Okay? Should we pray? Dear God, thank you for the healing power that you give and the healing power you gave Jesus to make us well when we're not feeling well. And once we are, we are so thankful and so overjoyed that we just want to get up and serve others the way you would have served. All this we pray in your name. Amen. Well, thank you guys for coming up today. Hi.
Let us pray. Holy God, you delight in creating life and beauty. Thank you for the abundant grace that you freely give. Let our church be a community that lives by this good news. Even our faith in Jesus Christ as a gift we receive. Use these offerings to further our church's mission, providing opportunities for people to grow in wisdom and to spread the harmony of your peace. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Relying on the promise of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. The gift of grace is for all people. Give confident faith to all the baptized that they may follow you wholeheartedly. Give new believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O oh God. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. In Jesus, you join humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depth of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Today, we continue to pray for Todd Miller, uh, who was having some breathing problems. We continue to pray for Elaine Curry, Chris Hansen, Bruce Garrow, Mike Edwards, Wendy Lustfield, John Lustfield, Carla Lustfield, Kelly Johnson, Holly Miller, John Daniels, Jane Hansen, Jody Reed, Corey Van Allen, Roseanne Sloan, Randy Schumacher, Helen Burns, Joyce Larson, Diane Peterson, and Doug Christensen, and we give thanks for the healing that was given to Daryl Sloan, and we're so grateful that he is back today joining us in worship. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We continue to pray for all those who continue to suffer through just an assortment of, of, of ailments because of COVID, because of unforeseen violence, financial difficulties, discrimination, we pray that as the vaccines start to come out, as we experience warmer weather, as we anticipate spring, that we start to see a light at the end of the tunnel. And for all those people that are suffering for so many various ways, we pray that you allow them to see the light of Jesus so that they too may see the light at the end of the tunnel. Hear us, O oh God. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And I forgot one prayer as I'm looking out uh, in the audience. It hit me, and we give thanks for Becky, that her surgery turned out well, and that she's doing better. So sorry I missed you, but as I glanced out, I, I knew there was another person that we should give thanks for. So again, thanks for that as well. Our closing hymn is hymn number 98, Alas, and Then My Savior Breathe.
worship tonight, receive the benediction in the love of God the Father, in the grace of Jesus the Son, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, may you go in peace. Amen. Amen. Now go in peace to love and serve the Lord someplace else. Amen. Amen. Thanks be to God.